friends, welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast with Beto and Mili. How are you doing today, Mili? Super excited, Beto. Today is a great day. Today is a great day. Mili, I have here in my hands Jesus for Everyone by Amy Jill Levine. Jesus for Everyone, not just Christians. Okay, we are Christians, we're evangelical, um, Pentecostal, I don't care. But uh, she's amazing, Millie. I've been following her work. I've been reading the Bible in a year. I've been reading or listening to Josephus, Flavius Josephus. So I've been learning a little bit more of the history of, of Judaism or the Jewish community before Jesus, right? Because Jesus was a Jew. Mm. So today we have an expert on the topic. Let's bring her on. Are you ready, Millie? Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's do this. Let's see. There we go. Amy, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm well, and I'm delighted you want to talk to me. So thank you. Why is that? Why do you feel delighted? We want to, like, is there people that don't want to talk to you? Um, it's sometimes people get really nervous about talking with a Jew who happens to know a fair amount about Jesus. Mm. Because typically Jews dislike Jesus? <laughs> Not at all. Um, I don't. I don't think contemporary Jews know enough about him to make a judgment one way or the other. Mm. So one of the reasons I wrote uh, Jesus for everybody, not just Christians, is to say that the Jewish wisdom that Jesus conveys and the stories that are told about him, which all have to do with his Jewish context, are actually more important. Uh, not just for people who are Christians, uh, Orthodox, Pentecostals, Evangelicals, Liberal Protestants, Roman Catholics, whoever, uh, I think these stories are universal. Mm. So I think it would be good for Jews to know a little bit more about Jesus because that helps us recover part of our own history. Mm. And I think it would be very good for Christians to know a little bit more about that Jewish background that you were discussing before, for example, looking at Josephus. Because so often I found that Christians who know nothing about the background get the background wrong, and then they get Jesus wrong. Mm. So if we put Jesus in his own historical context and listen to him as a first century Jew, then everybody benefits. Mm. Mm. That That's so good. Yeah. Okay, that, there's so much power in just that statement, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit on my take on it because like i said i've been reading josephus been reading the bible and i've been telling Millie, Millie, for for the people that live in jesus's era especially maybe for the the religious leaders it was not easy it must not been have been easy to accept jesus uh and accept the claims he was making because the more i read like old testament and the history it's like, wow, they were really looking for a leader. Like Moses had proof that he was sent by God, basically, right? And he shows up before the leaders, like his community leaders first, and he shows signs. And then they're like, okay, you, you come from God. Let's do this. Like maybe you're the liberator, right? And with Jesus, it was kind of similar. When we get to Jesus, they're demanding a sign from Jesus, right? And then Jesus elaborates on like, you're only going to get the sign like Jonah, right? And things like that. But all that to say, I feel like it's, it. now I feel like I understand maybe Judaism a little bit more. Of course, like I'm, I'm not there yet, right? And I grew up evangelical and, and I have, I grew up in a complete different context. But when I read scripture and the New Testament, I'm like, this was no easy task for for Jewish people to understand who Jesus was, given right. the background um, they had. E even Jesus' followers have problems here. You know, mm. Matthew keeps saying to the disciples, or, you know, oh, you people of little faith are in Mark, don't you guys mm. get it yet? Mm. Um, and we don't have any unified picture of him from antiquity either. I think, I think the followers of Jesus were really smart to give us four different portraits, so four different gospels. And we have Paul's take, and we have the take in the epistle to the Hebrews, and we have the take in the book of Revelation. So we're getting lots of different versions of how people understood Jesus back then. When it came to accepting any sort of messianic claim, the people were basically saying, wait a minute, we've got a tradition that tells us what will happen when the Messiah comes. So what will happen? There will be a general resurrection of the dead when everybody comes back. There will be a final judgment. There will be peace on earth. Um, kids won't be crying anymore because they're hungry or they're scared. Um, the world will be as the Our Father prayer puts it, you know, things will be on earth as they are in heaven. Mm -hmm. And the people are saying, you know what? We're not there yet. 
So if you were this promised person, and first century Jews had various views of exactly what the Messiah would do and when and where the Messiah would come from. So if you're this promised person, where's this universal evidence for the change? You couldn't find it. But if you look at Jesus' own followers who are proclaiming the resurrection, for them, everything changed. They had a completely different way of looking at the world. So for me, rather than get into the tussle of, you know, is this theologically true or is that theologically true? What I find to be more helpful is let's look at Jesus' ethics and see what he's mm -hmm. instructing people to do and see how those ethical concerns fit within a first century Jewish context and more see how those ethical concerns can inform people today. Mm -hmm. That, I think that's that's the question I have. Well, do you like, want to say something? Elon, Elon Musk was saying that, right? Mm. He's like, I'm no like Christian, but I love their values and mm. I stand up for their um for for what they have to to show. Yeah, like, like that, I think that's I think that's the assumption a lot of people have, right? Mm. Today, like you're saying um first century followers of Jesus versus today. I think most people think like, oh yeah, Jesus, I like Jesus' teachings. Right. And maybe mm. don't, they don't go deep into it. Right. But I think in general, there's like that, um, like Elon Musk said, right. Oh, yeah, I kind of like Christianity. Right. I'm a cultural Christian, whatever that means. Um, but but I think that's important to note, Millie and Amy, if you could uh, maybe help us understand this. Um, Jesus is, well, I guess. You said Jesus has ethics on different topics, right? Like you talk about economical ethics, even sexual ethics, um, different types of ethics. And I think sometimes when we read Jesus also, it's he comes across a little bit harsh towards <laughs> different people. So on one end, we have like, yeah, Jesus' teachings are awesome. Jesus' teachings, yeah, like I... I follow Jesus' teachings, right? Elon Musk or whomever. But then on the other hand, like you really dig into Jesus and he's a, I mean, he's not easy to understand, right? Sometimes it seems like contradictory <laughs> and like, okay, you're for everybody, but then you're talking to this woman and saying even the dogs, you know, when she says, uh, when he says, I don't give food to the dogs, right? <laughs> so it's like, wow, those are harsh words. So how do you see Jesus in that light, like in today's day and age? Um, do you see Jesus more as a, as a fighter? Do you see Jesus more as a debater or do you see him more as a, a moral teacher? What is your like biggest take on Jesus on that sense? <laughs> You're asking me to put him into a box. <laughs> I don't want to put him into a box. Wow, okay, yeah. Um, so, and, and that uh, means I'm squared, right? Part of me maybe, is squared. <laughs> you know, and, the, and there's nothing wrong with that either, right? Um, so part of the problem, to go back to what you said earlier, is people who identify as cultural Christians. Mm. And they say, yeah, I'm happy to follow Jesus. But then it, when I say to them, well, what specific verses are you following? And it's like, well... Uh, we should love our neighbors. Okay, fine. But I've already got that in, in the book of Leviticus, right? Leviticus 19 mm -hmm. says you have to love your neighbors as yourself. And more, Leviticus says you have to love um, the non-native born, like the other or the migrant, the person who's not you, mm -hmm. who, who, you know, who might have been born somewhere else, mm -hmm. who now lives in your country. And you have to love that person too, because you knew what it was like to be a migrant somewhere else because you were in Egypt and it wasn't great for you. Mm -hmm. So what, what else is Jesus adding on? Um, and it, at times he's, he's really strong. Um, it, the, the Torah says don't commit murder, which I think is a pretty good bit starting point. And what Jesus does is what rabbinic Judaism calls building a fence about the law. He makes another law to make sure you don't violate the first one. He says, don't be angry because mm. if you're not angry, you're less likely to murder. Um, you know, can we extend that? Like maybe, you know, don't have, don't have nuclear weapons because you're less likely to use them. Right. Um, Uh, the law says don't commit adultery, which is a pretty good law. He says don't think about it because mm. if you don't think about it, then you're not going to plan it. And if you're not going to plan it, you're not going to do it. Mm. Um, so what he's trying to do, I think, is actually intensify the law 
what Jews would call Torah, which really means instruction, not law, saying, what is it that God wants us to do? And then how do we do it? So when we first started talking, we were talking about belief. Like, do we believe that this is the Messiah? Do we believe what Jesus says? And what I want to do is change the subject. I mean, belief is fine, and that's what theologians do. Mm. But I want to change the subject away from what people believe to what people ought to be doing. And how does Jesus help us do better? be better neighbors, be better family members, be better community members, be better children of God. And I think he's got a lot to teach us. But if we just go like the, you know, I kind of like Jesus, but I'm not really going to read the Bible and I'm not going to do the history. That's actually not taking Jesus very seriously. If one claims to love Jesus, which most Christians claim, and which is perfectly fine, I think it, it does them well to know something about the background. Because if you love somebody, I, ideally, I would think you would you want to know as much about that person as possible, which means where did you grow up and what were your parents like and, you know, what's your favorite sports team or whatever. Mm. You'd want to dig deeper into that context uh, within which the object of your, of your affection comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. I, yeah. Want to say something? I've been there before, you know. Uh, I think probably six years ago, I was not reading the Bible. I will say, I don't understand the Bible and I block my mind, but I'm a follower of Jesus. And somehow, like, oh boy, how I'm saying that I, I follow this guy and I don't know him. That's contradictory. And I feel like I was a dumb dumb <laughs> saying that, <laughs> right? Like, so now, uh, like, I'm so fortunate to understand that, you know, because I think, uh, It's, back in the days, I always say, I hate English. I don't like English. I will never speak English in my life. But then I move here and I have no option. So like, no, I, I, I just changed my mind. Like, no, I need to learn this. I need to get out of my comfort zone. And that's what I did. So now I'm reading the Bible and not just that. Now we're reading other kind of books to open, you know, and to see through the lens of people like you, just to be open, right? Because uh, like you said, mentioned, Jesus is for everyone. And I love this. And, and the, the I, I, one in a specific, I share on my Facebook, my private um, Facebook account, when you mentioned the prosperity gospel offers false promises, even as if the forms biblical teachings, Jesus was so many things, right? But a promoter of wealth was not one of them. For exactly. Jesus and the Bible, and a lot of money is usually an a indication of sin and selfishness. I Absolutely. I live this. And people were so offended. Even, right, and then you even, look at people who say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but they've got like four kajillion dollars in the bank. And I'm just like, Beto, that's, that's what I want to share with the world. That's what I've been living my whole life. Because I, we live day by day, right? We, I never had money in my life. I grew up super poor. Here, I'm rich. I have everything I need. I have a... a um, I, I have a place where I can rest and sleep and eat. For I have a beautiful family. I have three kids, my husband. I don't have a car right now. We don't have a car. Our car broke and we sell it and <laughs> we are borrowing my mother-in-law car, right? And where I live here in um, Costa Mesa, close to Newport Beach, Orange County, is people with a lot and lots of money. Like you can, you can see, you know, I live my neighborhood. It's like houses, seven million dollars mm. compared to my tiny home. You know, it's a mobile home and I can, I, I'm living that. And it's like how these people can say I'm Christian and they know their needs of their neighbors. Right. And it's like this crazy difference. And a guy who like owns He has no kids, no family, and owns so many houses all around the world. And he's just building his wealth, right? And I, I work for him. And he was cheap. <laughs> 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 you know, 
all they're, you're, they claiming themselves have a lot of money, be a millionaire. I'm rubbing their feet. I'm helping them. I'm serving them. And they're cheap with me. And I'm just yeah. like, really? That's painful. Don't mention you have millions and treat me that way, you know? Because I have just this little, and this little I have when I hear like someone is in a need. I just don't care if I'm going to have something for tomorrow. I just give because yeah. I received so much, right? So two thoughts about that. that, that that's a perfect story. Um, when you started, you talked about feeling uh, foolish when, when you started to think, you know, I, I, I love Jesus, but I haven't read the Bible. I don't think that's foolishness at all. Um, I, I think that's what uh, Christians might refer to as the Holy the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Mm -hmm. right? um, the people who followed Jesus, the original disciples, you know, weren't planning on doing so, but suddenly something hit them, like Paul on the road to Damascus, or seeing Jesus by the seaside and calling Peter and Andrew, James and John. So the the call is not. It's like falling in love. You fall in love. It's not because you're stupid. It's because you fall in love. Then you do the digging. So I want to take away mm -hmm. that feeling of stupid or feeling of foolishness. That's that's just the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Uh, for me, uh, my heart is completely filled with my own Judaism, so I've never felt that call to worship Jesus. But boy, I think he was smart. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I take him like a teacher, but for people who, who worship him, I want to be able to enhance that worship. The other thing is with rich people, um, and this is what I discovered in working on that chapter in Jesus and Economics, um, is that there are a lot of people who on the outside look like they're rich, and their bank accounts are almost nothing, and they're too ashamed to admit it. Um, mm. Or they may be rich, but they're actually giving huge amounts to charity. Or they may have been poor when they were kids, and now just because of that early trauma, they need more and more and more. Mm. Um, so Jesus, um, who sometimes says things that, like, I, I know he's right even though I resist it. Like, don't judge. That's not your job. Mm. So at the same time, part of me is saying, why do you have, you know, oodles and oodles of money and 12 houses and whatever. But there's that Jesus whispering in my ear saying, are you sure you know the whole story? Mm. Who are you to judge? You know, do you have more than you need? Uh, and the fact mm. is I do, right? Like, I don't know. I don't need all these books in my library. <laughs> um, and since you I retired do. from university, I've had to give away a lot because I don't have enough mm. room in my house. Right. So what a luxury. I've got too many books. Mm. But we all pretty much sometimes we could share more. And I think what Jesus is doing is stop judging um, rather than complain about people who aren't doing as much as they should be doing, which I do a lot, by the way. I'm a very good complainer. But but rather than complain about them, saying, you know, look to yourself and say, what more could you be doing? Mm -hmm. So that's where he gets us. Um, not like in the TV commercials he gets us, but he gets us. <laughs> Um, he gets us in the sense of he indicts us or he mm. condemns us or in a very nice way. He says, you know what? You're fine. You're a terrific person. I love you very much. You should be doing more. Mm -hmm. And one of the cool things about him, at least according to the gospel stories, is he never asks his followers to do something that he himself will not do. So not only does he instruct in terms of verbal instruction or Torah interpretation, he then walks the walk. And says, here's how you do this. Um, and he's not a cookie cutter. Like, he doesn't say to everybody, sell all they have and give to the poor. Like, he needs Mary and Martha to be there to provide hospitality. Um, so it, there are different people who have different gifts and different charges. And in the stories, we see him meeting people where they are. So if you're a rich guy who's got too much stuff and you're defined by your stuff, then it's sell all you have and give to the poor. But if you're giving to charity... Um, like uh, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, then keep your money. But as long as you continue to give, you're doing the right thing. You, you in your particular situation, don't have to do best. And that's the importance of reading the text closely. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's so amazing, so profound? And I love that it's coming down to like real stuff. Right, like this, this, this things we're reading about Jesus um, so long ago. It's so relatable because we live it out, right? Like people within our circles that we're experiencing these things we read about in scripture, like you said, you know, for the rich, rich, young ruler, it's like mm -hmm. sell everything you have and then come follow me, right? Oh, I don't know if I'll do that, but I love that. So do you think 
Jesus, I mean, one, I, I think everybody in the world could see Jesus as um, probably one of the most significant parts of history or persons in history, in human history, right? I think most people, oh yeah, I agree. You know, Jesus came, he existed, uh, he changed culturally our world for sure. Uh, but do you think, I mean, this is more like a theological debate. I don't know, but it seems to me like you're saying G when Jesus comes, he kind of like extends the law or, or to me, it seems like he goes to really the heart of why the law was given in the first place. Right. So it's almost like we have God out there speaking to humans. If we, if we look at the the history of Israel, right? He's speaking to mm -hmm. Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and all the patriarchs and Moses and gives the law. But I think when, when Jesus comes, this is my take. I just want to know your take, right? When Jesus yeah. comes, it's like, okay, all of that that you've been learning, all of that that God's been speaking, this is what it really means, right? So in that sense, I mean, it, to me, it's super compelling, the fact that he claimed he was God. Right. But um, how do you he see? Does, yeah. He doesn't quite say that. He doesn't get up and mm. say, I am God. Right. Um, yes. that, that would have made things easier. And, that, mm. you know, that's why it took the church uh, up until the fourth century to, to develop the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm. Uh, but he does say the father and I are one. That's in the Gospel of John, mm. as if as if God's will is his will. Uh, but he also talks about giving everything over to the father. And you can see that in the Christ hymn in Philippians. You know, it's all to the greater glory of God. Um so in terms of Trinitarian things, is Jesus God, is the spirit God? I, I leave that up to theologians. I mean, that's that's above my pay grade. I just want to know why people are following him in the first place. And if I can figure that out, which I think I have to some extent, um, then how might his instruction be viable today? So the Torah, the Pentateuch, like Genesis through Deuteronomy, does not come with an instruction manual. It's a law code. And the Problem is that all codes, all law codes need instructions because we need to figure out what do they mean. Like in the United States, we have an amendment that says we citizens have the right to bear arms. Okay. Does that mean we have the right to own machine guns? Uh, does it mean we have to put our guns under lock and key? Um, so what exactly do these laws mean? And that's why we have people like lawyers. God bless them. <laughs> um, Luke's not a fan, but there are other lawyers in the Bible that are just fine. Um so at the time of Jesus, there were different Jewish groups trying to figure out what exactly do these texts mean? How do we actualize texts which were set in, in the period of the wilderness a thousand years earlier, more than a thousand years earlier? How do we actualize them today in the first century, let alone in the 21st century? And that's why we have Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and the followers of John the Baptist, because they thought he was the Messiah, uh, and Jews living outside the land of Israel who had their own stuff to worry about, like Greek-speaking Jews and Jews farther east in what's now Iran and Iraq. Um, and everybody's trying to figure this out. Uh, there's no head Jew to tell them what to believe. And Jesus comes along and says, well, I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, one of the contributions he gives, which I think is brilliant, uh, and we can find this is kind of like a minor note in early Judaism, um, is uh, I think he's thinking that the kingdom of God is about to break in. And whatever that is, it's not what we've got now. So people who pray your kingdom come uh, mean that the kingdom that we've got is not the one that we want. Right? Um, uh, your will be done. Well, how do you, how do, you do that? Um, and he says, well, one of the ways you can do this is you can think about the end of the world is being right around the corner. The kingdom of God is breaking in now. Sometimes Christians will talk about the second coming. That's that model. So if you thought the second coming was really going to happen a week from Tuesday, you would change the way you're living now. Mm. And you would figure out, mm. this is really what's important in this? Not so much. Mm. Uh, telling my kids I love them, absolutely important. Uh, finishing this article that's due, mm, not so much. Um this is what Stoics were doing at the time. They were figuring out what's really important. The, the rest is not important. And I think Jesus is very helpful in, in getting people to focus. This is how you love. This is how you act. This is what you need to do in the moment. Mm. It's, it's a similar comment to what we have from rabbinic Judaism, post-biblical Jewish thought, um, uh, from the Talmud, where one rabbi says, repent one day before you die. I think that's brilliant. 
if you've done something wrong, you know, when it gets to be evening time and you realized you insulted someone or you should have done something that you didn't do or you did something you should not have done, you go fix it. You don't wait for the next day. It's like Jesus saying, if you're about to make an, this is a Sermon on the Mount. If you're about to put your gift on the altar and you realize your neighbor's got a problem with you, leave the gift and go fix the problem. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile? Um, how do you forgive? How do you let anger go? How do you focus? And I think Jesus is great in terms of that focus. Because if we could focus better, we could live better. Amen. <laughs> well, uh, okay. So here's something really, really bad <laughs> that I just noticed. I don't think I was recording on this end. I'm recording on this end. So forgive me because I was so excited. I think I didn't record here. I hope all of this has been recorded. Uh, it's kind of like technical stuff. All right, Millie, this is this has never happened to me before. This is so silly. I thought I was recording and I wasn't. And we were talking with Amy Jill for like 30 minutes straight about Jesus, about the Bible, about Judaism, about historic stuff. It's so epic. So now, because people maybe might have missed that, we'll just do a little bit of recap and pick it, mm. pick it right back where we were. Okay, so, so far, Millie, what do you think you're learning as we were talking with Amy? Yeah, we were talking about how... The, you know, the law, the, I'm sorry, <clears throat> the how the Jews were living that, right? So Jesus comes and he just is living and given like a structure, like more, he brings more clarity, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm picking from our conversation. Mm -hmm. But the way, the way she's presenting all this makes sense. It, it is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm delighted it makes sense. Good. <laughs> it should. Okay, so for those of you who mm. you know came late to the stream because I forgot to go on, <laughs> you were saying that Jesus is for everyone, and we have your book right here, Jesus for Everyone, Not Just Christians, and we were talking about your background as a Jewish person, your background as trying to understand Jesus because... Uh, you were trying to help. You, you would say if Jewish people today would look at Jesus, they would see, um, you said he's pretty smart, right? So <laughs> He's brilliant. Yeah. Right. I think he's a fabulous teacher. Okay. So what do you think people are missing when, when they don't look at Jesus? Maybe with the, with the eyes, at least that you are seeing him, right? As a teacher, as a fabulous, wonderful, no brilliant right. man uh why so, do people don't see him like that um it, it, there are different issues here for both jews and christians uh for the most part jews don't read the new testament it's not scripture for us any more than christians would say read the quran mm. or the bhagavad gita Ooh. um but but i want jews to read the new testament because the new testament is substantially jewish literature um, part of it is written by Jews. Paul's clearly a Jew. Paul's a Pharisee. Mm. Uh, in fact, he's the only Pharisee from whom we've got written records. So that's part of our history. Jesus is a Jew. Um, all of his initial followers are Jews. So this is also part of Jewish history. Um, and Jesus, I, I understand, and this is through the eyes of an historian, is a very good Jewish teacher who, teach, who teaches his fellow Jews how he thinks they should understand what God wants us to do which means interpreting the Torah, uh, for you the Pentateuch or the law, which means figuring out what it means to be a Jew and, and not, a, not a Gentile, not, not a pagan, not a worshiper of foreign gods, but a worshiper of the God of Israel. Uh, figuring out how to interpret the tradition in terms of how we think about our families, how we think about economics, how we think about foreigners, uh, the, the not us, uh, how we think about gender and sexuality. And more than that, if we could get a sense of how Jesus would have sounded to his first followers, that is a group of Jews, um, then we're in a better position to figure out what he might be saying to us today. How much is culturally contingent? You know, this is the way people were doing things in, in the first century. How much can we bring forward? Um, and I don't think that Christians should be stuck to say, well, Jesus said it and, and that's it, right? Um, it, it, any more than we Jews would say, well, Moses said it and that's it. We still need to do some interpreting, right? Because mm. otherwise we're living in first century Bible land, which would be silly. 
Um, so Jews and Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox have a stream of traditions. So interpretation over time. Protest Protestants following Martin Luther typically go back to the text, like Luther said, sola scriptura, only the text. Mm. But it, clearly we're not doing only the text, because if we were, there'd only be one group of Protestants. Mm. And I, I live in Nashville. There's a, a different Protestant church on every corner here <laughs> in the buckle of the Bible belt. Why? Because yeah. people are interpreting the text differently. Mm. So what are the different interpretations that people might come up with today um, and, and how might people who have been marginalized for various reasons because of gender or because of migrant status or because of physical ability, um, how might such people who have been marginalized find themselves in the text uh, and be able to find more good news? And how can we read the text without having to invent some sort of toxic Judaism over which Jesus comes and cleans stuff up? Um, because I find a lot of uh, people who claim to love Jesus, who know nothing about the historical context, mm -hmm. actually get a good Jesus by creating a bad Judaism. And I, I think that's bearing false witness against Jews. I think it's bearing false witness against Jesus. So if you've heard um, that first century Jewish women were oppressed and depressed and repressed and suppressed, and Jesus comes in along and, and events feminism, right, and the pantsuit. Um, no, um, it's much more complicated than that. But we learn from the New Testament, for example, that Jewish women owned their own homes. They had access to their own money. They had freedom of travel. They show up in synagogues uh, mm -hmm. where even disabled Jewish women, like the, the lady. Um, Jesus says she's bent over by Satan. I think she's bent over by osteoporosis. Um, you know, she's in the synagogue. There are Jewish women in the temple. Um, so why might J Jewish women have followed him? It's not because they're oppressed by Judaism. So there are other reasons which I can document. Um, or Jews think that, that if you're wealthy, you're blessed by God. But if you go back to all the Jewish sources, they're pretty much unanimous. Um, if you're blessed by God, then you need to give to the poor. Um, and if you're poor, well, that puts you specifically under God's protection because mm. Deuteronomy is clear about this. God is the special protective of the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the migrant. So let's clear up some of this anti-Jewish stereotype that's there. And then we can better understand Jesus as a person of his own time, but as a person who also speaks across the centuries. And now you're speaking to us because we we are migrants here in America of a very particular kind. I'm just going to leave it at that for now. But yeah, just the reader will interpret <laughs> or the listener. But uh, yeah, you're speaking to us because uh, I was saying I've been reading the Bible in a year, I've been trying to understand, you know, Jesus's background as a Jew, like, wow, the, where does he come from? And now I have even more insight when I, when I read the gospels, it makes even more sense. Like, wow, there's all this, this play when it comes to uh, Judaism. But I love that you're saying, you know, let's, let's almost like get rid of that toxic perspective of Judaism Like, I agree with you, and I want to applaud you for even saying that, because I feel like as a Christian, I almost want to repent of, of a little bit of that, you know, just taking it like, oh, man, Jewish people, you know, <laughs> they, they oh, put sweetie, Jesus on the cross. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, I am a Jewish mother, right? I know how to make people feel guilty, right? That, that's, mm. that's just my culture. I, can do. I don't want anybody feeling guilty if they've, t if they've stepped into some of that toxic mess. It wasn't their fault, and I don't think you should feel guilty for something that's not your fault. Mm. However, once you realize that you don't need to make Judaism look bad to make Jesus look good, um, and that perhaps because of um, insufficient education or stereotype, um, you've stepped into it. Mm. Once you realize there's a problem, now I will make you feel guilty if you continue to go in that direction. Mm. <laughs> but, okay. but you know what? You don't have to. I think, I think Jesus is a fabulous teacher, and I don't have to make Judaism look bad in order to get there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good. And you were saying uh, Paul was a Pharisee, right? Yeah. My understanding is, was Josephus also a Pharisee? Probably not. Probably um, not. Th yeah. Wow. So it used to be that we thought he was because he says at one point um, he comported himself according to the Pharisees. But he's doing so because they've got the ear of the population. 
Um, Josephus never self-identifies as a Pharisee. Um, and when he talks about the Pharisees, which is actually, I mean, Josephus, there's a lot of works by him, right? Multiple books. Books, by the way, means scrolls. So multiple mm-hmm. scrolls, the Antiquities of the Jews, the War of the Jews, his autobiography, um, his, his ap- ap- apology uh, for Judaism, Contra Apian. Anyway, he actually doesn't say very much about the Pharisees, but when he does, um, to use the British term, he thinks they've upjumped. They've gotten ahead of their station. Why? Because Josephus is a priest. He's a Jerusalem priest. He's very elite. Um, he's got some royal background in there in his ancestry. And he thinks people should be listening to the priests, which is the inherited class of teachers. Right? And the Pharisees are just a bunch of lay people. Um, they have day they jobs. Right? They're potters and textile workers. Like Paul, Paul works in leather. Right? Um, and, and they have dedicated themselves to learning more about what God wants and to living the way that God wants. And consequently, the people are listening to them. And Josephus is saying, why are you listening to the Pharisees? You should be listening to the inherited class. And from what we know about Pharisees, and we're we're learning more and more, uh, Pharisees were actually the liberalizers of the time. They they tried Mm. to make things as easy as possible. Um, And at the same time, they're saying, you know, these priests are in the temple and they have all this holiness. Well, you're all supposed to be, according to the book of Exodus, a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. So you know what? When the priests touch the sacrificial elements before that they wash their hands, you can do the same thing. You can be, you know, at, at, at your own table, you could be like priests in the temple. And all, all you have to do is wash your hands before you do that. And the people are thinking, wow, mm. this is a ritual that enfranchises us, that makes us like the priests. And at the same time, when the Pharisees develop some of their rituals, the people are thinking, yeah. And when we do these practices, we're also resisting Roman assimilation. We're saying, hey. We're Jews. We're not you guys, which means they're they're basically ancient versions of multiculturalism. They're saying, how do you express your own identity in a situation of colonialism or in a situation of occupation? And it's consequently because of the Pharisees and their followers that Judaism was able to survive uh, in the diaspora outside the land of Israel and when the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70. Mm-hmm. Wow. OK. Yeah. That's just, that's a whole lot of stuff. Yes. Okay, so the the temple was destroyed in uh, 70, was it 70, right? 70. And that's the second temple, correct? And was it Ezra that rebuilt the temple uh, that came back? That's the temple, when he came and rebuilt the temple, that's the temple Jesus attended in Jerusalem? That's correct. However, um, in 586, the Babylonians conquer uh, Judea, Judah, the, the, which is where Jerusalem is. Uh, they take a bunch of people into exile. They destroy the first temple. That's the one, according to the text, built by King Solomon. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get repatriated uh, in 538 when King Cyrus of Persia, whom, by the way, the prophet Isaiah calls the Messiah. There could be more than one. God's anointed. Anyway, Cyrus conquers uh, er, Babylon. This would be like per- this would be like Iran conquering Iraq. Right? So Cyrus the Persian conquers Babylon. He says to the people in exile, you can go home, right? So they go home, but there's no temple. So Ezra comes in to try, Ezra's a priest to try to help. Nehemiah comes in and we begin to see the the construction with the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. However, King Herod the Great, the one who kills the babies in the Mm -hmm. gospel of Matthew chapter two, decided that the temple at the end of the first century before Jesus, which is when Herod takes the throne, wasn't good enough. So he engaged in this massive reconstruction. Um, Crafts people from all over the Mediterranean are coming to Jerusalem so that by the time Jesus gets to the temple, when he's a child, when his parents Mm -hmm. take him, according to the Gospel of Luke, um, when he goes in as an adult several times in the Gospel of John, just once after a couple of childhood incidents in Luke, it's huge. It's much bigger and much grander Because when Herod the Great rebuilt the temple, he not only built it as a house of God, which should be, you know, gorgeous and innate and all that. He also built it as a tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. So the outer court is the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles were actually welcome to come and worship. And if Mm -hmm. they wanted to convert to Judaism, they could get into the inner courts. So the place is enormous. It's huge. Um, It was completed sometime in the early 60s, and Rome burnt it down in 70. Wow. Okay, is that the one when Josephus mentions that David was buried, right? At, at um, I think it says at the temple or at some sort of, uh, what do you call, where they where they put people when they laid. 
and <laughs> it says that he was buried with riches and so much like gems and stones and whatnot. And then Josephus mentions that later on, that's that's the same place that Herod went in and took out. I mean, <laughs> just take my words, right? A bunch of money out of the the tomb, so to say. Is that is I mean, is that accurate historical fact? Uh, is that just Josephus? Well, part of the problem with Josephus is, um, to some extent, he's dependent upon earlier sources, mm. um, including one of Herod's court historians. So then, then you have to worry about, well, um, if you're the court historian, which means you're the, um, uh, the publicity manager for the government, mm. um, you're going to say things that you think the government will like you to say. And mm. since there's no way of checking one way or the other. Um, so Josephus tells us that he's going to describe, in fact, all of Jewish history, pretty much starting with Adam and Eve in, in mm. his multi-volume work called The Antiquities of the Jews. Yes. But if you compare what Josephus says to what the Bible says, there's a lot of fudging going on. Mm. So what Josephus is doing, which is what all historians did back then, is he's doing spin control. Uh, for our purposes, thinking about Jesus, well, if David had this incredibly opulent burial... And Herod the Great, who, who apparently did have a very opulent burial, and we get some sense of that from archaeology. Mm. Well, then, uh, did Herod think of himself as the new King David? Did mm. Herod think of himself as a type of Messiah? And in the Gospel of John, we find out that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus under 100 pounds of myrrh. That's a huge amount of myrrh, right? Um, and it's super expensive. So, first of all... I don't think he's coming back, right? Because, you know, resurrecting is one thing. Coming out of 100 pounds of myrrh just, you know, adds to the difficulty. <laughs> they think he's dead a long time, right? So the wow. idea is to keep away the, the smell of, of the rotting corpse. But what John tells us is that Jesus was buried with the same royal honors mm. as King David and King Herod. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Okay. So here's a few verses that I have where you no, know, this whole thing with the temple this is why i kind of wanted to talk about it because it's a big deal right like the temple in judaism is a big deal and it was for herod right almost like saying i'm the new david that's wow that's yeah. super interesting but what about when jesus says in mark 14 58 we heard him say i will destroy this temple that is made with hands and in three mm -hmm. days i will build another not made with hands and in john to 20 Jesus answered them destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up the Jews mm -hmm. then said it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will right. raise it up in three days uh, what's your take on that you know as Jesus talking about the temple and I mean I guess I, I as an evangelical can say oh yeah it's because Jesus is the temple himself right and the veil was torn right. and now we have access to God but how do you take it um in light of just reading it and your Ju Judaic Jewish background. Right. So let, let's, let's just go back from the last comment you made and then we'll work backwards. Um, I find it standard among Christians to say that when the veil of the temple is torn and this is the death of Jesus, that it means that everybody has access to God. Not what it means, because everybody always had access to God. God is not stuck in the temple. God can be accessed anywhere. God can be accessed mm. in the diaspora, which is how wow. Daniel or Esther right? Or the people in Egypt managed to talk to God. Or mm. Paul, who lives in Tarsus, right? Mm. Which is in Turkey. It's in Asia Minor. Wow. So it, everybody had access to God. That, that wasn't the issue. Um, what I think is going on there, and here's where history is helpful, is we know from Josephus, so your friend Josephus, um, <laughs> that the curtain of the temple had embroidery on it. And what was embroidered on it? The signs of the zodiac. So what does it mean? Mm. It's like heaven opening up. Um, it, in the same way that heaven opens up at the baptism, when the voice from the heavens comes down and proclaims Jesus, the beloved son. But also in Judaism, um, there's a tradition, and this goes back to Jacob, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Jacob, uh, that when someone dies, you tear a piece of your clothing. So when Jacob thinks that his son Joseph is dead, he's really not. He's in Egypt, you know, about to become the prime minister. Um, when he hears that Joseph has died, he rips a part of his garment. Mm -hmm. And this is a practice still done in Judaism today that people are in mourning, like if a close relative dies, you actually rip a part of your garment or you pin on a little black cloth and you tear it. Um, so the rending of the temple veil is God being in mourning. 
Jesus says in Matthew and Mark, why have you forsaken me? The veil rips. That shows Jesus is not forsaken at all. God is in mourning. In fact, the universe is in mourning. It's not access to God. Everybody already had that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those misconceptions that Christians have about Jews, restricting access just to Jews. No, mm -hmm. they never did that. Wow. Um, in terms of Jesus saying, um, it, it, there are some New Testament scholars, this goes a bit far for me, but there are some New Testament scholars that suggest that Jesus never went into the temple and made a mess in the first place. Uh, but people took that comment about destroy this building and I'll raise it up in three days as, as, as a warrant to develop the story. I think he actually did kind of make, make a general mess in the temple. Um, but what he's saying is ultimately the temple is not important when it comes to what God actually wants. So, does God want sacrifice? Well, yeah, God commands it. But the really important thing is that you be reconciled with your brothers. The really important thing is that you repent. Um, the Gospel of John, and here's how you would read it, says, oh, the disciples realized he was talking about his body. Fine. So that's John's interpretation, and that's fine. Uh, but I think it's the matter of um, when he goes into the temple in Matthew and Mark, in Luke, and he quotes Jeremiah. It's a direct quote. Uh, you have made this a den of thieves right, or a cave of robbers. Um, I think that's what he's concerned about. So Jeremiah is not saying a temple is where people exploit people. This is not about exploiting the poor or anything like that. Uh, but a den of thieves or a cave of robbers is uh, where you go to feel safe, um, like a hideout, um, like a lion's den. Lions don't kill their prey in the den. They kill the prey in the forest and then bring it into the den to eat. Thieves don't rob in their caves. They rob outside and then bring all the, that loot into the cave. And what he's saying to the, to the people is, you know what? You can do all these sacrifices if you want. It really doesn't matter. The temple really doesn't matter. What really matters is that you repent and you live a decent life. And if you're just going through the motion, it doesn't count. Mm. Um, so in that sense, it would be like saying to a church, you know, and it's a gorgeous church. I mean, it's a beautiful church. You destroy this building and I'll build it up in three days. Oh, how do we live without the church? Mm. You don't need the building. Mm. Um, you need your neighbors. And you need your heart to be reconciled and, and you need to, to find love. The building is really irrelevant. And I think because Jesus likes to use exaggeration, like if your eye offends you, pluck it out, right? You have to hate your parents. It's all exaggerated, hyperbolic language. I think this is part of this model. It's not the temple that's important. It's repenting that's important. It's not the building that's important. It's what's in your heart that's important. And finally on that, if Jesus thought the temple was so awful, then it makes no sense that his followers would continue to worship there. Mm. So Paul in Romans says one of the gifts of the Jews, you know, what's the value of Israel? He says much in every way. And one of the things that he says is worship. The Greek term is latreia, but the Hebrew would be avodah. It means temple worship. And we see in the book of Acts, Peter and John worship in the temple. Paul offers a sacrifice in the temple. Paul prays in the temple. So it's not the building that's the problem, and it's not the way it's being run that's the problem. It's the attitude of the worshipers. Mm. It would be like, um, you know, you sin during the work week. You come into church on a Sunday morning. They pass a collection plate and you drop in a $50 bill. I mean, you should be so lucky. Um, so you drop in a $50 bill and the person who puts in the money says, well, I've just given a major donation to charity. Everything is perfectly fine. And then goes back home and starts sinning again. Mm. That's the den of thieves. And that's the problem with the building as opposed to the internal transformation then being shown by outward appropriate action. Wow. Oof, that's so deep. I, I take that to heart, you know, and I think that's beautiful. I I don't know. I, I feel like that's more like worshiping Jesus, right? When when we say, you know, worship in spirit and in truth or um it's to me it's that idea, you know, like there's there's a heart behind everything God's been trying to say to humans in the law. There's a heart behind and I, and I think that's that's the core of it is is can we get along, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a that's a little bit bigger than than religion even, right? And but how do we reconcile that? That would be my last question before we go to our emojis. Unless Millie wants to say something, but how do we reconcile coming to Jesus with with so many different interpretations, lenses, religion, um, and maybe, because to me, he points to God, right? Like you said, I and the Father are one. 
So to me, to me, that's the final invitation. But do you have another way to reconcile like all these divisions maybe that we see? As, <laughs> <laughs> bring uh, back yeah. these right now, please. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. I'm, I'm a biblical scholar. I'm not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not I'm not sure that a number of these theological concerns can be reconciled, and I'm not sure they should be reconciled, because that type of reconciliation uh, leaves out diversity. And, and I th think one of the glories of the biblical tradition is that diversity is still there. Um, and you can have diversity and, and still follow a, a, the same type of ethics, right? So even if we believed about Jesus different things, and people will believe different things, or about the Holy Spirit or about God, when we turn the conversation from theology or belief to behavior, then I think we're in a better position to have that type of, well, I might not agree with you in terms of belief, but I do agree with you that healthcare is important. And how do I know that? Because Jesus takes care of people's bodies. Mm -hmm. This also tells us, by the way, that free healthcare is a miracle. But it does tell us mm -hmm. that taking care of people's bodies is important. Um, uh, how do I deal with... Um, with my enemies. Well, yeah, my enemies may still be my enemies, but if I try to treat them with love, which is part of the Jewish tradition, um, you know, we're, we are forbidden uh, from mistreating our enemies. We have to treat them with kindness and compassion. That's, that's Torah. Love is a bit much, but again, Jesus pushes on things. Um, then regardless of what we believe, we're, we're able to live better on this earth. Um, and when it comes to all those theological differences, for the most part, Jews are able to handle them. Why? Uh, because Jews are not just a religion, we're an ethnic group, um, descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to tradition, connected to the land of Israel, according to tradition. Uh, we are followers of Torah, according to tradition, it's our culture. Uh, but if you're an ethnic group, like Americans, or Venezuelans, or Koreans, or Italians, whoever it is, then you can have disagreement. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, where we're currently having lots of different disagreements over politics, the one thing most of us can agree on is we're all American citizens and we all have the right to vote. So Jews can have all those disagreements in terms of belief. But when it comes to how do you love your neighbors yourself, then I think we're in a better position to talk with each other. I think Jesus encouraged that sort of communication. And I think the church, by giving us four gospels, said, compare these texts. What mm -hmm. messages do you get? How might one text help you interpret another? Since Jesus says, don't think I've come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it, which means kind of chopping it off, you know, getting to the heart of it. Then go back and look at Torah and figure out what God's will is in the first place and study this and then have an argument about it, which is in fact what Jesus does with fellow Pharisees. You don't argue about something in which you've got no investment. How do you think God wants you to live? What does your neighbor think? And then have enough humility to say, you know what? The neighbor may be right. Mm. So good. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Millie, do you have any last words or question before the emojis? We're going to the emojis. Just thinking. I just need to go and do more research. And, you know, I feel like I have so many questions in, in my brain. Um well, you can always right. You can always email me, and I've got a number of books translated into both Spanish and Portuguese, so I'm I'm happy to send them along to you. Nice. Oh, so sweet. Thank cool. you. Yeah, I just I just love people. You know, uh, I really, really do. I don't care which nationality, if you're rich or you're poor. I just love people, and I can see their good in them. Sometimes people can come and tell me all. The bad, how bad is this person? Then I was like, okay, that's how you think and that's your experience. I'm different, right? And I just see people different. I don't care if you have Jesus or you're, uh, I don't know what you believe. I just believe that you're a human and you have the, exactly the same needs as I have. I want to be loved. I want to be respect. And I want that for that person too. Right. Exactly. And, and it, it is so important to give our give our hands to our neighbors and love them. For me, it's I don't care what religion you are. I respect you, respect you and I love you because that's who is Jesus to. He came and he proved how or he teaches how to love. Right? right. And and for me to mention God and that huge power and it's so wonderful that I can come to him and it's, it's for perfect. everyone. 
Right. So as my mother taught me when I was a little girl, and I'm, I'm very old, um, but she said, listen, um, it, Torah teaches us that everybody is in the image and likeness of God, because that's mm. the creation narrative. Mm -hmm. Male and female and everybody in between, right? So, mm. We're all in the image and likeness of God, which means that I can look at your faces or the faces of my husband or the faces of my kids and go, this is love, that's easy. But I have to look at the face of Hitler or the face of mm. Pol Pot um, or, or the face of some serial killer mm. and say, that person too is in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. And that makes it harder, but it also makes us better human beings. Because once we demonize someone and say you're a child of the devil or something like that, we're giving them too much power and we're taking away the creation, we're create, taking away God's creation from them. And I don't want to do that. Wow. Well, that's so good. So, so it's, powerful. It's hope for everyone. <laughs> there is hope. Okay. If, if we listened. Mm. Yeah. All right. So we're going to bring the emojis. And this is how we wrap the episode, okay? I, I wasn't doing this the first time we talk, Amy. Now I do this, <laughs> where I bring these li little silly emojis, but I think they're fun. And they have a purpose, all right? So the idea behind the emojis is that you walk through the five of them with a summary of what we discussed today or a thinking of the future, all right? And I'll tell you what the emojis are. I call it the spectrum of beliefs. So we go from the worst idea, which you can imagine is the red one. That's the worst idea to the best idea, which I call the divine emoji. All right. So to kick off the wrapping up of the episode, the blasphemous emoji, I call it. What is the worst idea when it comes to Jesus for everyone that you can think of? Um, if we construct Judaism incorrectly, we will get Jesus wrong. And if we have to invent a toxic Judaism in order to make Jesus look good, it's bearing false witness against our neighbor, it's bad history, and it's bad theology. Skeptical emoji. Uh, where do you see skepticism, or what are you still skeptical of? Um, in part of our conversation, we were talking about Uh, judging rich people inappropriately. Um, you know, they, should be, they, they shouldn't have all this wealth. They shouldn't have all these jewels or money in the bank. Uh, and at the same time, to recognize that we do not know what is in their heart. Um, and as soon as we start judging other people, we fall into that trap that Jesus says, don't judge, because, you know, the measure you give is the measure you're going to get. Um, so I'm always warned when I, I have an initial thought about, oh, how dare that person say something? I don't know the full story. And Jesus warns me to withhold judgment. Wow. Inspired emoji, what gives you hope? The very idea that uh, Christians like you would be willing to talk with a Jew like me about Jesus, um, and that even though we don't agree theologically, because theology is what's in your heart, it's not your head. It's, it's a matter of calling rather than intellect. But the very idea that we can disagree so fundamentally about theological issues and, and still engage in a, in a wonderful conversation and still learn from each other, that gives me hope. So good. Okay. One to the last, the holy emoji. What's a holy idea according to AJ Levin? Uh, that we are all created in the image and likeness of God. And if we deny that divine spark in anyone, we lose part of our own humanity. Um, and that people who, who worship Jesus, uh, many of you, um, the idea that you would also be interested in getting that Jewish background correct. I, I, I think that's a form of holiness because it's a form of respect for the tradition that we share. Mm. Phenomenal. And the last one, the divine emoji. What's a divine idea, according to Amy Jill Levin? Um, I, I don't have to create anything, you know, from scratch because I've already got the Bible to tell me. Uh, the book of Leviticus says you should love your neighbors, yourself, and more. Uh, the same chapter, chapter 19, says you have to love the not you, the, the, the not native, the migrant or the immigrant. Uh, most translations, stranger or sojourner. You have to love them too. Um, and the book of Deuteronomy says you're supposed to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And Jesus comes along, and when he gets asked, what's the greatest commandment? You know, God forbid he'd respond to a direct question with a direct answer. He gives you two. Love God and love neighbor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that's all you have to do. But if we begin with those starting points, the rest of it is much easier to follow. So wonderful. <laughs> so good. Okay. 
So that's how we wrap the episode. My friends, thank you so much for being here. Amy, you have you have amazing books. Where can people find them, follow you, maybe a website or where do you want to point people to to find more of your work? Oh, I'm old and I'm not tech savvy. I have a Facebook page that my daughter manages. I deliberately have not learned how to use it. Um, and uh, you can track me on Amazon, which is probably the easiest way to get to me or some of the other presses like Harper or Abingdon. Perfecto. And you guys can follow us on ChristianPodcast.com. We have episodes in English and Spanish. And if you like this episode, like, subscribe, share this with a friend. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you so much. You're so easy to love. You Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for being the light and the salt in this world. I just What a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. It was beautiful today. Thank you for your love. All righty.